Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. Hello, it's Lawrence from Corporate Warrior. Thanks for tuning in again. This time I had the opportunity to interview Roger Schwab. I think I'm saying his last name right. Hopefully I'm not butchering it too much. Um, Roger was really interesting. Uh, he really good to get on the podcast because uh, he came very highly recommended um, by Bill De Simone, actually. And his background is that he founded Mainline Health and Fitness, which is an awesome high-intensity training facility in Philadelphia. And he's also been the head judge um, for many a bodybuilding uh, Mr. Olympia, Mrs. Olympia contest. Um, so my understanding is that actually he was present during a lot of the um, classic um, contests that might have involved Arnold Schwarzenegger and many other famous bodybuilders. So very cool to talk to him. And he was also mentored by um, Arthur Jones, who is obviously one of the founding fathers of high intensity training um, and had a lot of good stuff to say uh, about fond memories of him. Um, so very interesting to talk to Roger and get his perspective on high intensity training, the state of it currently, um, what he doesn't like about the high intensity training movement, um, some of his views on protocols and most effective ways to elicit the best responses. Um, all around, very interesting conversation, really nice guy, and um, hopefully get him on for a, a part two, because a lot of things I didn't get to ask him. Um, I always end up writing too many questions down, um, and then, you know, they, they, the questions work quite well in that the guests often can expand on those for some time, but um, it leaves me with lots of unanswered questions, especially if we've got a limited time window. Um, but I guess better to have too many than, than not to have many at all. Uh, anyway, I am digressing now. This podcast is sponsored by hituni.com. That's H-A-T-U-N-I.com. Hituni are the providers of the best online personal training courses for high-intensity training. So whether you want to become an awesome personal trainer and understand this um, form of evidence-based exercise that you can teach it to others and build a business, or whether you just want to learn as much as you can about high intensity training so that you can get the best results for your own body this is definitely the website for you if you go to hituni.com simply add your course to cart and then enter the coupon code cw10 for a 10 percent discount and if you want access to the resources from this podcast in terms of books and um, other links that we, we speak of and websites, please go to corpwarrior.com. That's C-O-R-P warrior.com. And there you'll find all of the podcasts, show notes, and tons of valuable resources to get your teeth into. Thanks again for supporting the podcast and hope you enjoy this one. All the best. So, Roger Schwab, you are the first strength and conditioning coach at Pennsylvania State University in the early 1960s. You founded Mainline Health and Fitness in 1976. You're the former International Federation of Bodybuilders head judge between 1977 and 82, and you judged five Mr. and Miss Olympia contests. And then lastly, although I'm sure there are many other accolades, um, you are the author of Strength of a Woman, the nationally acclaimed bestseller. Uh, is there any key events that I might have missed that um, you're particularly proud of? Well, yeah, we were the first facility to import X-Force equipment. Oh, right, yeah. In January of 2012, of which we had ordered that equipment in 2009. And subsequently, I'd gone to Sweden several times to um, help them work on that equipment and just do some final tweaking for some of it. And that has been basically our passion for the last three years since we've got the equipment. But we go back to, you know, my strength training. If you want to go back into that, but <clears throat> before high-intensity training, I can do that with you also. So if you ask me anything specific, I'll try to give you the best answers I can. Excellent, yeah. So um, I guess, yeah, that would be a great start. So tell, tell us about your background and how you got into high-intensity strength training. When I grew up, I was um, very thin. It's a kind of a typical story about a small-bone 
kind of a kid who always had trouble making weight to play sports. And football was always my favorite sport. And I wanted to get myself bigger and stronger. And this is uh, in the early 1960s. And I kind of struck out on my own, really not knowing what to do, because I don't know how old you are. But uh, back in those... How old? 27. Well, so you weren't even born. Not even <laughs> close. But back in those days, there was no real information that I could really glean, except that we had, you know, to buy a barbell set. But I quickly fell in love with the Olympic lifts because I was interested in the Olympics and Olympic lifting at the time was press, snatch, and clean and jerk. So in my house, you know, I started to doing those lifts and I got fairly proficient for a very thin guy, albeit with several injuries in retrospect that have bothered me all of my adult life. I got proficient in the fast lifts or the quick lifts or the Olympic lifts, whatever you wanted to call them. And when I went to Penn State in 1963, 1963 was the first year I believe that, well, powerlifting came into play in 1964. But 1963, Olympic lifting at Penn State where I was at was um, the type of lifting that that we participated in. Not any bodybuilding lifts, but we got, you know, the fast lifts seemed to dominate. And I got proficient and I got good for a guy who's very thin. And in 1964, when the first powerlifting competitions on the East Coast were held at Penn State, I entered and set records for my weight class at the time, 180 and a quarter pounds in, all, in the bench press, the squat and the deadlift. The football coach at Penn State at the time was a guy named Rip Engel. The assistant coach was Joe Paterno. Rip Engel came to that um, powerlifting contest, saw me win the events, and asked me if I would train some of his you know, football players. It was very informal, and I accepted and proceeded to train these athletes in the same way I had trained, although... There were nagging injuries that I had. I figured that these guys were bigger and stronger and could probably handle this. I trained them six days a week, except for one player, the captain of the team, who could only train twice a week because he was a pre-med student. Well, you probably realize that, Lawrence, after all this, that only one player on that team really made results. He was the one who was training twice a week. Everybody else trained six days a week, quickly overtrained. And when I ten- tested them later, almost every one of them was at the same strength as before I started or weaker. And I couldn't understand why. But because I was training their upper body one day and lower body the next day, and I figured their upper body would recover while their lower body was being trained, so forth and so on. And I didn't understand then the concept of systemic depletion. But I learned, I learned from my mistakes. By the time I graduated in late 60s, they didn't have MRIs at the time, but a lateral X-ray showed major degenerative change in both my cervical and my lumbar spine. I had a spine of an 80-year-old man at 22 years old, and that was really upsetting considering I had radiculopathy down my arms, neuropathy in my feet, and here I am just a young man. So I realized I was doing something really, really wrong. And it was coincidentally around that time that 1970 now, that Arthur Jones started to write his articles in Iron Man magazine. And the first article that I read was an article called The Upper Body Squat. Do you remember that one? I don't know. I haven't actually read a lot of his work. I've got to be honest. I want to, though. The Upper Body Squat was an article without any pictures in it and talked about an article, I talked about an exercise for the upper body that worked a major muscle mass like the squat work for the legs and the hips. And that exercise turned out to be the original Nautilus pullover machine. Subsequently, I went down to Florida, visited with Jim Flanagan, who was the general manager of Nautilus, Ellington Darden, who became the director of research, and Arthur Jones himself. And <laughs> at least for me, there was no turning back. Once I had my first Nautilus workout, I was completely hooked on it. 
I had never felt anything like that before. I had never felt the muscular pump. I had never felt the cardiovascular work. And before this, I'd never felt any type of stretching on equipment. So we were actually working our strength, our flexibility, and our cardiorespiratory conditioning in one workout instead of just rotating around your hips and your knees like running, we were working every major muscle group. And it just seemed to me to, to make common sense. Mm-hmm. And that was the start of my career in high intensity training. And I never looked back. That's awesome. Thanks for going through that. Um, let's talk about your business, uh, Mainline Health and Fitness. What is the standard workout protocol that you, that you advocate there? Well, the business started in 1976 with nine pieces of Nautilus machines in 200 square feet. And you have to understand today it's 25,000 square feet and approximately 100 Nautilus and MedEx machines. And that doesn't even include X-Force. Wow. So way back when, when we first started with the nine machines, we set the equipment up in a pre-exhaust style of training. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. So Arthur had said personally to me and in public and in publication that the idea of pre-exhaust working as best possible a single joint movement going with no rest into a compound movement would potentially give the best of all worlds as far as training. You're isolating a muscle as much as possible and then bringing in another major muscle group to fatigue the primary muscle deeper into failure. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to make sense to me. And that's how we started. And all these years later, that is still the way we train. Although we've experimented with almost every type of training style. We've done straight sets. We've done split routines. We have done... Um, 2-4 protocol, 5-5 protocol, 10-10 protocol. We've done almost everything in the last, since 1976, or almost 40 years that I can think of in the high-intensity vernacular, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. So we've tried pretty much all of it. And we have learned during the way. We started training three days a week. Pretty soon we found that the Monday workout was the strongest workout The Wednesday workout was almost as strong, and by Friday, we were weaker than we were on the Monday workout. So, of course, it takes time, and Arthur always says you learn from your mistakes, not by your successes, and so eventually, we cut down to twice a week, and we stayed with that twice a week all these years until X-Force, and X-Force, which makes more of a demand on the system, Mm. systemically, we cut that down to once a week. So now the people who train on Nautilus and MedEx machines are usually twice a week or once every five days, and the people who train on X-Force are once a week. Mm. So that's pretty much where we are. We prefer pre-exhaust. I think it's a very safe way to train, a very smart way to train, an efficient way to train, and it keeps the forces down by doing the compound movement as a second exercise instead of a primary exercise because we found with some people doing that big, heavy movement first, we were seeing, at least at our facility, more joint problems than we do doing pre-exhaust. Right, okay. Just on the X-Force machines, found that very interesting. I read a bit about that. I understand that they load more on the negative phase of the movement um, to kind of provide that deeper inroad. Um, can you talk a bit about that? I mean, why? So, you, okay, that reduces the workouts down to once a week because they suddenly become much more intense. Um, but can you just elaborate on, on the, the benefits of those machines? Sure. But yeah. to do that, I have to go back into the past a little bit. Sure. When I opened the facility in 1976, Arthur introduced the Nautilus Omni machines. I don't know if you're familiar with the Omni machines. Yeah, seen, seen those, yeah. The Omni machines were an Omni chest, shoulders, bicep, tricep, and a multi exercise machine. Thus, on the upper body machines, you're using your legs to do the positive part of the exercise, and you're using the upper body to do the negative. Mm -hmm. Being 
a hundred percent. Either I do something all the way, or I don't do it at all. I bought the Omni machines. There was only a few of them sold in the United States, so I bought all five of the machines, and we started to do negative only workouts. Uh, this is way back in the late 1970s, and we trained about 15, 20 people wanted to do this type of workout. We did it after hours, and without exception, almost all of us started to get stronger and realize our physical potential by getting larger muscles, stronger muscles in a very, very quick period of time, but there was a big problem with it. The Omni machines, which was Arthur's first attempt at negative work, were very, very large machines with a lot of chain and a lot of friction, especially the Omni shoulder machine, which probably had 100 feet of chain. The Omni chest was the best one, and the Modi exercise allowed, allowed us to do negative dips and chins. I wasn't crazy about the bicep and tricep. The strength curves just didn't feel right for me. Mm -hmm. But our workout would consist of one set to 40 or 50 reps on the, neck, on the duo leg press, which was done in a duo symmetric fashion. Then one set of the omni ch shoulder negative, one set of negative chins, one set of omni chest negative, one set of omni bicep, and then one set of um, omni tricep or negative dips. So we really had a five or six set negative workout and it was tremendous. But some of us, me included, got hurt because we didn't really understand the cause and effect. When you do a negative chin and you start to use weight around your waist, when you get up to that top position and lower yourself down, it is such a concentrated, difficult exercise that once you get to the bottom and the full hang, you almost have to catch your breath, you take your hands off the bar, you put your hands back on the bar, you walk back up to the top, and before you start your second rep, you're maybe 10 or 15 seconds into it. So instead of performing one set of 10, we wound up performing like 10 sets of one, which makes it dangerous, and the muscle is recovering very, very quickly between the repetitions, so each rep feels like a single repetition, mm -hmm. and that, can, that leads to injury. What we should have done is use less weight kept our hands on the bar the entire time and have somebody pushing us by the backside right back up into the contracted position and lowering ourselves down. Right. Do you understand that? Yeah, absolutely. Because you're taking tension off the muscle when you stand down and you still don't think that's the right way to, to go about that. If we did it different now, I'd make sure that there was no rest at all between the repetitions. With X-Force, it solved the problem because you're doing what Arthur would call today negative accentuated exercise. And I'm very, very positive knowing Arthur as well as I did. And that means talking to Arthur almost once every other week for 30 years yeah. uh, that he would have loved X-Force because it is a very safe way to train and a very efficient way to train. And you're doing the positive, which allows you to have the feel of the positive stroke before you go into the negative stroke. So on an X-Force machine, we do three, one, five, three seconds positive, one second hold, and five seconds on the negative so that you feel that positive. And when the turnaround comes, you don't have to brace yourself or jolt yourself. You're already into the set. It's not like somebody hands it off to you and then you have to hold it. And if they don't hand it off right, you understand what would happen. Mm -hmm. So with X-Force, you're in control the entire time. And the systemic inroad on X-Force, you almost have to experience to believe. I can imagine. Now, Ellington Darden has done a lot of research on it, but we're the, his facility, I mean, Joe Cerulli's facility in Gainesville, Florida, and Mainline Health and Fitness are the only two facilities in the States that have this equipment. So to talk about X-Force, you know, is inconsequential to most people because they don't have the equipment. But it is a very, very effective, efficient, safe way to train. And systemically, the inroad is greater than anything that I've experienced in nearly 50 years of training. Is it a be-all and end-all? No. And can you do without it? Of course. But if you have the potential to ever use it, 
it is just a um, tremendous piece of work. Wow. Now, I had, a, I had a look at, I saw some of your videos on YouTube, and the, the engineering looks pretty spectacular, um, and hopefully get a, get a go on one of those at some point. You know, you mentioned there about Arthur Jones, and um, obviously I'm familiar with Arthur Jones, and I've heard lots of very entertaining and very inspirational stories about him. Um, and you hinted earlier that you, you probably know a lot about him that a lot of people don't. And I'd be really interested to hear a couple of, I guess, um, moments or, or um, memories you have of him that would be really interesting to hear. <clears throat> well... I think that Arthur Jones was the brightest man that I've ever met, probably the most misunderstood man that I've ever met, and certainly had the greatest, at least as far as exercise, the greatest influence in my life. I wouldn't have never, I would never have gotten into business in this field if it wasn't for Arthur Jones. Um, Arthur, you didn't really converse with Arthur as much as attending his lectures. When Arthur got on the platform, he was going to say it as it was. And he never really held back. And today, in my opinion, at least as far as strength training, common sense strength training, what he originally did has merely been copied for the last 40 years. I don't think there had, besides X-Force, there has been nothing new there's prettier machines and there are more contoured machines and the padding might be better and the seats might be better or whatever, but the original function, he, Arthur looked for the function of a muscle and designed machines according to the function. So the function of the pectoral was to draw the humerus down across the body. That was the primary movement of Arthur Jones's arm cross machine. Uh, the function, nobody at the time back in the 70s was working their neck directly or consequential uh, or, or, or correctly. People were doing neck bridges and winding up hurting themselves more than helping themselves. Arthur came out with a four-way neck machine. He came out with a, sh a shrug machine, a neck and shoulder machine, a, a neck rotation machine. So he understood the seven functions of the neck and built equipment accordingly. Later, after Nautilus was sold, he... He started the MedEx facility, or MedEx business, and designed a lumbar extension machine that anchored the pelvis in order to do pure isolated work for the muscles that extend the lumbar spine. He did the same thing for the neck. He did the same thing for the muscles that rotate the torso. People think they understood Arthur because he was a lot of bluster and he talked a lot you know, about politics and things like this. But when I talked to Arthur personally myself, he was not at all like this. Uh, Arthur was not a hater. Arthur was not a racist. Arthur was a brilliant, brilliant man who, if you understood his past and you understand his formulative years and understood him growing up, then you have understood Arthur Jones a lot better than what came out in print at the time. Arthur looked for confrontation in the field because he really... I, he spoke so intelligently, and when his methods weren't accepted by the medical community or the coaching community or the exercise science community, he got defensive. But as he always said, nothing much surprised him. He was just disappointed. He did miraculous things uh, as far as the spine, as far as the muscles, as far as heart-lung conditioning. If I was, if I was you, uh, Lawrence, I would get a hold of bulletins number one and two and read his early writing so that you can understand the initial thinking and put it into practice of what common sense is today in a field where common sense is not common. I absolutely 100% will. Um, that's, yeah, you've inspired me to do that. Um, what's your fondest memory of, of uh, you working with and being mentored by Arthur Jones? Just the, uh, my, my one that we, we were very, very close Two, that he asked to see me right before he died. I wrote his eulogy in Iron Man magazine that if you look through the archives, you probably will be able to find. And the memories of the conversations that we had on the phone, which were very rarely about exercise, but about life in general, yeah. about his growing up, about his skills and understanding, about his reading ability, about the people he met along the way about the people who deceived him 
<coughs> about his successes and his upsets, um, about his, you know, his love of airplanes and flying, of animals, wild animals, insects, um, snakes, everything. And he considered himself, which I would agree, the last of the free men, meaning he, could, he felt like he could say and do whatever he wished. He found love in his life. He found happiness. He found tremendous upset. He was an explorer. He did things that no other man had done. And everything he did was, you know, 100% all on his own. And um, I cherish the days that I was fortunate enough to attend his lectures and listen to him and learn from him and be regarded as his friend. Oh, that's very cool. Now, I, his, his story is incredible. I mean, I, I learned a lot about that in um, Ellington Darden's book, um, The New High Intensity Training. There's a lot of um, some great, really inspirational um, stories about, about him in there. Um, just going back to your, your business, um, I understand that you include a cardio practice in your gym, which, which interested me because obviously a lot of the um, – people in the, the high-intensity training scene um, will tell you that, and I'm sure you know this, that a, a cardio workout is provided in the strength training. So why do you, do you provide that separately? I mean, if so, why is that? <clears throat> That's a good question, and it's, it doesn't have a simple answer. Yes, a lot of people in high-intensity don't agree with additional cardiovascular training, and with those people... I have no um, objection to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But I learned a long time ago that you have to give people not only what they need, but what they want. Mm. If you tell a runner not to run, he's going to find somebody or she's going to find somebody who's going to tell them that they can run. So what's the point of it? So how we got around that was if we were doing strength training with a certain person, and let's just say that that person also had a fondness of doing cardiovascular exercise outside of strength training several times a week. And if their workouts were progressive and they were getting stronger, then I had no objection to it. They were getting the best of both worlds, according to them. Now, however, if you ask me, does a person need additional cardiorespiratory work outside of their high-intensity workouts? Well, I don't think that they do if the workouts, the high-intensity workouts, are actually of high intensity. Mm -hmm. Arthur always talked about, and I think correctly so, that though the workouts were not a race against the clock, you really, literally wanted to go from one exercise to the next exercise, keeping your heart rate up the entire time. Thus, instead of just rotating around your knee or your hip or your ankle, like you do when you're running or jogging or even doing an elliptical machine or a stationary bike or regular bike and a high intensity workout, you're working all of the major muscle groups. You're keeping your heart rate up at the same time and you're also working your flexibility. Mm -hmm. So do you need additional cardio work? Not in my opinion, but are you dealing with human beings as people? Well, if you are, then you better be just as good as listener as you are a teacher. Because you have to be able to give people what they need and what they want, or else we have found that they won't stay on the program. That's interesting. Uh, Bill Day Simone, who told me about you actually, um, said exactly the same thing, and that is that's very interesting, and I, and I can see why um, why you have to take that into account. Bill D. Simone should get a lot of credit in in that he has looked at the high intensity field and has made his passion about doing exercise correctly to strengthen the soft tissues around the joints without hurting yourself. As Arthur said years ago, and Bill DeSimone has reiterated, proper exercise should never damage the skeleton. It should strengthen the muscles and the bones. And it does it in a very safe way instead of a high impact force of what they used to call you know, aerobic um, well, you know, um, weight bearing, you do it in strength training to strengthen the functional muscle, which in turn will strengthen the structural bone in a safe way. We don't do series of one repetitions. And as Arthur said, 
And as many of us understood, the deeper you get into a set, the safer it is. The harder it seems, the safer it is. So the tenth repetition or the eighth repetition, when you can barely move the weight, was not that heavy on repetition number one. It was lighter. And that's because you had the force potential on repetition number one that you don't have on repetition number eight or ten. So every repetition, while the intensity grows, the force is less. And that in itself stimulates a very safe and meaningful, progressive, dynamic workout. Excellent. In uh, 2002, that's quite a long time ago, this is the interview that is in your About Me uh, on the website, um, you said some people will progress with one workout per week. Um, do you feel that for some people, that one intense workout a week, you know, if you f- forget X-Force for a second, uh, but one workout on Nautilus MedX, a uh, high-intensity training workout per week, is not enough for some people to progress? We're all different. Mm-hmm. And some, we have a woman at our club who's progressed on training four or five times a week. And we've had some people who, who don't make progress unless they train once every other week. I think a lot of it has to do about the fiber types that people have. Mm-hmm. And we're all very, very different. You know, it's, it's like, <clears throat> which I'm sure you know, that if you have a person with longer muscle bellies and shorter tendons that that person can train incorrectly and stimulate results faster than somebody who does everything right with a different physiological makeup. So if you find the person who, when they flex their bicep, you don't see that tendon by the elbow and that muscle goes right into that elbow joint, he might not be able to, to demonstrate his strength like you might be able to, but you'll find that his arms will grow faster. Yeah. And it's, it's different leverages and different muscle bellies. Arthur said this years ago. Ellington Darden has said it in every book that he has written. So to answer your question is we look for the least amount of exercise that stimulates a response. And with some people, that will be once a week. And some people it might be less. And some people, it, it will be more. I was really fortunate growing up to be involved in the golden age of bodybuilding. And I was fortunate enough to be the head judge of the IFBB, professional di- division for a period of time, taking um, after Bill Pearl, who was previous to me after he retired. But I go back so far that I was fortunate enough to meet Steve Reeves, on many occasions, John Grimmick, Reg Park. It might seem inconsequential, but we learned so much from these people if we kept their eyes open. Uh, Reg Park, who judged contests with me, found in his life sometimes he didn't train often at all, at all, and he got tremendous results. But he was handling big, big, heavy weights, and he was responding to them. Marvin Eater from Brooklyn I met a couple of times. If you go back, Lawrence, and you see the picture of these guys, they were big and strong and had no drug look at all, no distended stomachs. They were just a product of their training. And if you trained hard, you really didn't need a lot of it. Were these, they, sorry, were these guys bodybuilders or were they on the panel? Just to clarify, I'm not... Well, if, if you study the history of bodybuilding, Steve Reeves played Hercules in the movies. Oh, right. He was one of the great bodybuilders of all time. He was Mr. America in 1947, right. Mr. Universe in 1950. Reg Park was Mr. Universe on multiple occasions. And these are the guys that Arnold Schwarzenegger looked up to when he was younger. And Mike Menser also, who was, you know, a very, he was a high intensity um, proponent. And I trained Mike Menser numerous times. Um, Mike could, Mike made great progress training three times a week in high intensity training, but he could tolerate it. I tried and I couldn't tolerate it. So again, I guess, to make a long answer shorter, um, it really depended on the person. If you were getting stronger, if you were training hard and heavy, you were probably realizing whatever potential you had. Now, some people say it's the variety in training that because the body will get used to the same routine. And other people will say you'll get enough variety by a different repetition scheme. 
people are different and you have to do your own homework for yourself to find out what better what works better for you but as a rule if your workouts are progressive if you're getting stronger in my opinion at least you're on the right track if you find yourself tired if you find that you feel great during your workouts but you're not as strong as you were previous then probably your body is not recovering from the systemic stimulus that you are producing from a high intensity workout make sense yeah no absolutely yeah no it does um what do you think about using time under load to measure performance versus using repetitions arthur used to have used to say that strength and anaerobic endurance are one and the same thing that means if you could do 500 pounds bench press let's say and 80 percent of that for with 400 pounds and you got a certain amount of repetitions let's say you got six repetitions thus if you went higher with that single rep you would get 80 percent you would get six repetitions whatever 80 percent was of your single one repetition max. That, to me, was the first attempt by him to identify fiber type. I, I can give you an interesting quick story. Yeah, uh, years ago, the American record holder in the 5,000 meters, Sidney Marie from South Africa, who became an American citizen, was invited with me down to Nautilus at the time to train on a new piece of equipment that Arthur had developed for the knee, for the muscles that surround the knee. It was a type of equipment that measured your force each repetition. So I went first and we counted the first repetition, which was not a safe machine, but was done for testing, and measured that first repetition and you did it as hard as you could, which he considered 100% of your momentary effort. On my second repetition, I was 93% of my first. On my third repetition, I was 85% of my first. And by the time I had done six repetitions, I was down to 78% of the force that I was able to produce on my first repetition. Sidney Marie, on his 12th repetition, produced more force than he did on his first, which showed that different people have different fiber types. Sidney Marie had a much more enduring type of muscle in his quadricep than Roger Schwab did. Every rep was fatiguing me, but for him, the repetitions were warming him up. Thus, if you take him out on the field to run, you want to warm him up. You take me out in the field, and if you warm me up, I'm going to be exhausted before the time I start. Different people have different fiber type and different endurances. And not only that, Different muscle groups might have different endu anaerobic endurance and strength, you know, than f from something else. So my quads might not be the same as my hamstrings, might not be the same as my pecs, biceps, and so forth and so on. These are, these are things that you have to find out yourself. So in that example then, um, is it safe to say that his slow twitch muscle fibers fatigued much slower than yours did, whereas you were able to fatigue your slow and intermediate motor units much quicker and that, that meant you reach failure quicker. I think what I can say to you well, that one. confidently is that he had a different type of muscle fibers and much a more enduring type of fibers. Right. Now, if you believe, and some people do, and I, I seem to fall in that category, that, and Doug McGuff has mentioned it, that um, it, you're, you'll bring in fibers throughout a set to failure. So your first several repetitions, you might be exhausting your slower twitch fibers, your middle repetitions, maybe your intermediate fibers. And on a set of 10 repetitions, those last couple, you might be involving your fast twitch. So it's a, it's a recruitment of fibers throughout the set. Mm -hmm. That seems to make sense to me. Um, I haven't done any research on it myself, but if you do one repetition as hard as you can, then you'll probably be bringing in all of your fibers or all of your potential fibers in a very dangerous way because you're not warming that muscle up and you're asking for trouble because the forces are going to be too great. Yeah. But there might be a, a, um, a sequential type of fiber recruitment during a set. And if that's true, that seems to make sense to me. Okay. 
Um, I noticed some interesting sort of breathing um, going on in some of the uh, videos of some of the people at your your facility. Um, how do you advise that trainees breathe um, when they when they train? You must breathe. That's all we basically tell them. <laughs> Keep your mouth open and breathe. A valsalva maneuver occurs when somebody's holding their breath really hard, and then they can. Um, you know, get a headache, an exercise-induced headache, which mm. can linger and can be detrimental for some future workouts. I had that happen to me maybe 40 years ago without anybody to tell me what an exercise-induced headache was. And it was like a shot in the back of my head, and, you know, you think you're having a cerebral hemorrhage. But what it was was an exercise-induced headache. So we've realized now that, first of all, the people who get these are usually people who train the hardest but are holding their breath and not relaxing. So that when you're trained to try to relax your body, except for the muscle group you're working, to keep your mouth open and breathe, I think that that's good advice. We don't anguish over it. Some people have different breathing techniques. But as a rule, breathe regularly and normally the best you can. Keep your mouth open. Don't hold your breath. Don't tense your face up. Don't squeeze your eyes tight. Try to focus on the muscle group you're working the best you can and, and focus your energy into that muscle group. Okay. Um, what is it that you don't like about the high-intensity strength training scene, if, if anything? I don't like the idea that people who really are in the same camp you know, are fighting consistently about whose equipment is better, what training style is absolutely the best, um, I don't go for that. Um, people attack me for using X-Force equipment. I didn't invent, I wasn't smart enough to invent X-Force. I just used the equipment. The people who attack X-Force are people who, who have not used X-Force. But do I have any less opinion of Nautilus or MedX machines? Certainly not. Uh, I think it's great equipment. I think X-Force is the next step. But you certainly are going to realize your potential using any tool if you train it hard enough. I think machines are great. I think they're safer. Um, but, but if somebody's going to argue about one set versus two sets and about 10, 10 seconds on the positive and 10 negative and get mad at somebody who does five and five, I, think that I, I, don't, agree, I don't agree with that. And I think it separates us where we should really be coming together. Yeah. But as a rule, when people you know, have their own equipment, and are in the business of selling equipment, they're going to be a little bit more defensive of what they're buying, you know, what they're trying to sell. And I understand that. Yeah. I just don't understand too much the, the antagonism and all this stuff that goes on in a high-intensity community. It's, it's not worth it. We're all together. We're all in it. What they should be talking about is CrossFit and some of the other ballistic-type exercises that, you know, has nothing to do with sports medicine. And whatever results are stimulated, I think the orthopedic cost is greater than the physical or the psychological benefits. At least that's my opinion. Yeah. I think what you talked about there, a lot of the, the details of high-intensity training, um, I've heard that being referred to uh, as mental masturbation quite a lot. Um, are you familiar with James Steele and James Fisher in the UK? No, I'm no. sorry. That's, that's okay. They're, they're two scientists working away there that have come up with some interesting studies, and, and that's where I, I learned the, the mental masturbation uh, quote from, but never mind. Um, I also learned you used uh, strength training to help some people alleviate uh, severe medical conditions, including breast cancer. Um, can you t talk to me about that experience and how that, how that helped? Sure. We, yeah. um, we take quite an interest in the sport, the medical aspect of it. Many, many years ago, as a matter of fact, it was the first day that Mainline Health and Fitness opened. We had a woman who walked into the club who had a sleeve going down her right arm, her left arm it was. And I didn't know what it was, but as it, as it was in retrospect, she had lymphedema, which is a swelling of the tissues of her arm when lymph nodes are removed after breast surgery. So she had a very big, heavy left arm and a normal-sized right arm. And she came to me and she said, you know, my doctor says it's not a good idea to use this arm because, you know, um, any type of blood flow might congest it even further. 
Even way back then, it seemed common sense to me that increased circulation should push those fluids, you know, open, you know, make make it her arm, you know, better circulation, mm-hmm. not less circulation. So she started doing the Nautilus program with me two or three days a week way back in 1976. And several months later, although her left arm was not as small and developed and toned as her right, was a ton smaller than it was when she started. I wrote articles about this and sent out this information to OBGYNs and orthopedics in the area. And as a rule, they didn't respond at all to me. And the ones that did said, you know, you're out of your league on this one. It's very sad. However, years later, a Philadelphia-based exercise scientist at a University of Pennsylvania wrote a study in the New England Journal of Medicine about lymphedema, saying that probably strength training was the most important thing for lymphedema and for the circulation of whatever remaining breast tissue a woman would have after a mastectomy. So I sent her my original notes and she got back to me immediately. And, um, you know, in retrospect, we were a forerunner of modern research without doing the research. We learned a lot about osteoporosis during this period of time, understanding that if you strengthen that functional muscle around the bone, you can strengthen that bone. So when we started working with the MedEx lumbar extension machine, we started to see reversals of T-scores on women's lumbar spines and even their hip just by doing abductor, adductor work as well as leg presses, leg extensions, and leg curls. For scoliosis, we found that with adult, I mean, with um, adolescent, pre-adolescent youths, usually females, that if you did torso rotation, you could strengthen the muscle by that isolated torso rotation, the muscle by that spine, those thoracic muscles, and take the new growth of the spine and, and get the spine stronger, thus growing in straighter by strengthening the muscles that surround that spine, something that should have been common sense. But the medical community still hasn't accepted it, but the, the children's mothers certainly have. And so now we have a couple of pediatric hospitals that are referring us patients for torso rotation. So I think, again, we were pioneers in that also. So for scoliosis, for osteoporosis, for lymphedema, and just for, you know, certainly the knee, which is the largest, most inefficient joint of the body, you want to strengthen the soft tissues around those joints. Nothing else even makes sense. And if you're running or jogging and have do high-impact work without strength training, you're at a risk because the true weakest element is going to give out first. So it only makes sense to strengthen the muscles around the joints. And in our opinion, high-intensity training does that most effectively, efficiently, and safely. That's a good answer. Um, you've, obviously, you've been um, training for a very, very long time. You've got tons of experience uh, in this arena. What is your advice to people who have been following HIP for a similar time, um, and are in the more advanced stages of their training? Well, we certainly have found that people, trainers, especially advanced trainees, will do their best if they're supervised. Even somebody who considers himself very advanced. Arthur used to say to me that he was a 100 percenter, and he said only himself and Dick Butkus were the only two people that he knew that could push themselves sufficiently um, without being supervised. Everybody will train harder if they have proper supervision. You will, your workouts will be shorter, they'll be more intense when somebody is pushing you. That doesn't mean somebody has to be pushing you and screaming at you or doing force reps with you or whatever. It just means that your form, you want to ensure that your form is good and you want to be taking each set to momentary muscular failure, in my opinion at least with the people who I've trained in my life, people have done better if they do those hard repetitions at the end. There's controversies today about how close to failure should you go, 90% or 70%. And as Arthur Jones always said, maybe 100% is not necessary, but how do you measure 90% or 80%? 
So we believe at least working to positive failure on exercise. That's really interesting you say that because um, Skylar Tanner, who I recently had on, um, said that, yeah, after 90%, it's kind of law of diminishing returns. But like you said there, you know, just make, just going to failure and maybe inroading for a few seconds at least guarantees you that you are over 90% so as to produce the best stimulus. Provide the That's best my stimulus. opinion. But as I said to you earlier, if you, you, that you're only comparing yourself to yourself. Mm-hmm. Once you start comparing yourself to somebody else, then you're making a huge mistake because, again, that person with different leverages, with different muscle belly lengths, could produce or stimulate greater results than you training maybe 50% to failure. It's only you against yourself, and you've got to know yourself. As far as myself, whenever I've been able to add muscle on in my life, it was always from brief, hard workouts where if I kept a journal, I could see that I was handling heavier resistance than I had previously in the same exercise routine. Would that be over what time period? What, one after the other? Or could it be if you were looking at maybe six weeks worth? Does that make sense? I would say, I think your example is fine. I was 67 years old before we got X-Force machines. I've always been lean. I've always been muscular. I always carry less than 10% fat, but I don't have long muscle bellies. And I was muscular, always muscular, um, but I hadn't really stimulated any meaningful results. I did my body fat with a um, Tanita body fat um, scale when we got X-Force, and I did it. Three months later, I gained five pounds, and my body fat showed exactly the same at 7.8%. Whereas my body weight went from 170 to 175. Mm. I do not say for a minute that a Tanita body fat scale is 100% accurate, but it seemed to be over the years reproducible. And I was shocked by this, but I shouldn't have been because other people we trained, we started to see exactly the same thing. People were putting muscle on who hadn't put on muscle for a long period of time. Was it X-Force? Yes, but the theory behind it was their intensity was higher. And that higher intensity, in my opinion, is what stimulated the response, the overall systemic response. And Ellington Darden, if you get a chance to talk to him, seems to explain it very well in his latest book, The Body Fat Breakthrough, in that it seems that the heavy negative stimulates an inroad, a deeper inroad, and this inroad allows the body to release hormones that it would not do during regular type of training. Insulin, growth hormone, uh, a series of several different hormones that previously, you know, might not have been known. Uh, He's the one to speak to about that, but that might be one reason why X-Force seems to, you're building muscle while you're oxidizing fat at the same time. And that seems to be what's happened to the people who train hard on this equipment. Interesting. Yeah. Now, are you when you say hormones, you're referring to the myokines and cytokines that come out of muscle. I think Doug McGuff has been talking about this lately. Yeah, he's that quite would be new. another another very smart physician who could elaborate better than I could on that. But yes. Yeah. No. It, no worries. Um, yeah. I mean, I've had Doug on twice. He's been fantastic. Um, trying to get Ellington Darden on, but he's a, he's a very busy man, so I'll continue to work away on that one. I would suggest you keep, keep trying. I will. But you should learn a lot from Doug McGuff. Oh, yeah, certainly have. Um, cool, okay. So well, what advice do you have for um, senior citizens doing high-intensity strength training? I don't see any uh, contraindications at all as long as they break into it. I think it's great for them. I think research has shown that People in their 70s, 80s, even, look, everybody after a certain age starts to lose muscle mass, sarcopenia. Um, What percent each year, who knows? But if you want to stay ambulatory, common sense tells you that you have to strengthen the muscles. All muscles do is move you and support your skeleton. If you strengthen your muscles then you're going to be more ambulatory in your 70s, 80s, or 90s, or whatever. So I see no contraindications. Mm. You should break into it for sure. 
but I think it's the smartest way to train. Yeah. This has been awesome, Roger. I mean, you've you answered these questions so well. Um, I just got a few minutes, so I just wanted to ask you a couple more questions quickly, if that's okay. It might overrun by a couple minutes. Sure. Is that okay? And um, what are your top recommendations when it comes to books in this field? Bulletins number one and two by Arthur Jones are definitely the most important. Okay. Um, I think uh, Doug McGuff has an excellent book or two books. The Body by Science in this field is great. Uh, Ellen, anything that Ellington Darden writes, uh, I think, is well worth reading. They're the only ones I'm familiar with. They're the only ones that I have kept up with. I'm sure there's more, but they're the ones that I am most familiar with. So um, <laughs> Arthur Jones first, and Ellington Darden and Doug McGuff, I think, would bring almost anybody who's interested in this field yeah. up, to, up to standards. That's a good answer. And what, what are your top five tips for anyone trying to optimize their results in health and fitness? So to, to, to get as much muscle mass as possible and to feel as good as they can and et cetera, et cetera. You'll learn by your failures more than your successes. Um, I would keep a journal of your workouts. I would keep your eating under control. Um, I think you should eat good food, and I think the biggest problem, as Arthur Jones said once, was not so much what we eat, but how much we eat, and most of us eat too much. Keep your eye on your waist. If you're adding thickness to the waist, then you're taking in too many calories. If you're too lean and too overly muscular, you might be a little bit you know, deficient in your calories. If you're not taking drugs, which in my opinion, nobody should, then keep a journal and follow a workout or several different workouts and a period of time later come back to those workouts or if you're doing that one workout all the time, measure your strength increases by where you were previously and the way you look. By necessity, if you train hard, you're going to have to train briefly and the harder you train, the briefer you're going to train. Mm -hmm. So train hard, train briefly and enjoy your life and, and, and hopefully the exercises will make you feel good enough that it will stimulate a response and ensure your quality of life outside the gym. And the days that you're not in the gym, don't think about it. Get outside and enjoy your world and, um, and don't worry about it. And don't be a slave to your workouts. We used to say if you missed a workout, somebody's catching up with you. Probably, it probably is that if you miss a workout, you're doing yourself a little bit of good. You don't need a lot of training you just need to train, but it doesn't have to be that you're a slave to it. I think that's great advice. Um, you're obviously a very successful businessman. What, uh, what would be your top advice, top, top three tips for someone who wants to be successful in business? First thing would be have a philosophy. Know exactly what you believe in and teach what your philosophy is. Two, have a passion about it. If you're teaching something that you don't do yourself, I don't think you would ever be successful. And three in my carefully considered opinion after 40 years, stay smaller instead of bigger. I think the biggest mistake I made was the club became way too big and it's much, much harder to handle. Keep it small, believe in what you're doing, follow your advice of what you're doing and teach what you believe so that you go home from work feeling that you are doing the best you can to help people stimulate a response and allow them to rest enough that they allow the stimulus to take place. That's good advice. Um, Roger, what's the best way for people to find out more about what you do um, and, and get hold of you? Your we have a um, website, www.mlhfmainlinehealthandfitness.com, mm -hmm. and our Facebook page every day shows what we're doing in the club and, um, you know, the things that we believe in. But, um, you know, find out for yourself whether you're lifting barbells or using machines or whatever you're doing. Um, stay focused. Stay strong. Train briefly. Keep your form good. And you'll probably be doing everything you need to realize your own physical potential. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, look, thanks very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I know you're very busy. Um, 
love to at some point do a part two um, when you've got some free time in the future. Uh, there's a lot of questions I didn't ask you, which unfortunately I, I don't have. Well, I'm sure you've got it, not not got much time either, but I don't have time to go into those now. Um, but I'll certainly certainly be in touch when this goes live, and we'll we'll get it out there so everyone can can hear your views on this stuff. The answer is yes, because I think it should get out there. And look, um, I've been doing it for 40 years now, and I'm still passionate about it. And there's a lot of things that go on that there's a great orthopedic cost and people should never get hurt training. They should, exercise should never damage the skeleton. As I said earlier, it should, it should strengthen the soft tissues around the joints. Absolutely. No, I think you're absolutely spot on. Well, look, uh, Roger, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I'll, I'll be in touch. I will talk to you anytime, Lawrence. Thank you, Roger. I appreciate it. All the best. Have a good day. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 